I've had fun doing this little series entitled We're Not in Kansas Anymore, a reminder of how things are changing. And we've spent the last two weeks acknowledging that our world is changing and is always changing. There's nothing new in the history that we face right now. Our circumstances are very similar to things. History continues to roll forward, and we are able to see what the Lord will do, and he calls the church to adapt. He makes it a living organism that will be able to challenge uh, the way our culture looks at the world, and we are planted there for that very purpose. And God is doing that through his institution called the church, and we are part of it. We make up the church visible, and we enjoy what the Lord is doing in our midst and through us. And a few weeks ago, Matt uh, did a sermon series for us. He actually preached on this passage. So I want you to uh, hear this passage again this morning. It's odd that we do it together at the same time, but I want you to look at it like it's bookends. Uh, the front end, and now you get the back end, and here we are looking at this passage again. Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, said you cannot step into the same river twice. It's always going to be different. And so in our, it's a, a story, it's an uh, idiom to tell us about the changing world that we live in. And the church continues to have to look and see how we can change. And I'm talking about strategy. I'm not talking about our message. I'm not talking about the, the doctrines, the core of what the scriptures say. We're not saying that we water that down to reach our community. It's that the way we might go about doing so would change. And you've heard me make some of those challenges before us. The church has always had to ch make change. And as we start looking and analyze and look what the church is doing in our culture right now, we need to admit in America the church is declining. That's the sad reality of what we're facing. Listen to this statistic again. It comes from Tom Rayner, who is a person that does a lot of uh, study on the church and its ministry in the world. He said, just over 10 years ago, it took 20 members of a church one year to reach one person. So let me say that again. It took uh, 20 members of a church one year to reach one person. Today, it takes over 85 members one year to reach one person. So if you think about that change alone, what does that mean for Cornerstone? Let's apply it to our attendance. Let's apply it to our membership. That would mean that if we were to follow this pattern, that would mean three or four people would come to Christ this year in this congregation. Now, I have been involved in five or six funerals since November. Our funerals are outpacing the people coming to Christ at Cornerstone right now. So if this statistic is true, that every year there might be three or four, we have seen double of that leave this world. And then if we think about those who might move from our community and we add that up, that every given year we would have the possibility of maybe just at best breaking even and remaining the same. So my question is, do we need to change? Does something have to change in order for our church to flourish, for our church to grow? And I think we can be challenged as we look at what's happening before us. Most churches <clears throat> have ignored the Great Commission, and it's now become the Great Omission. Tom Rayner said that in one of his books. I read a book this week called The Autopsy of, of, the, of a Deceased Church. And his study was looking at all the churches that have closed and looking at the, the common ground that caused them to die. And in that setting, he said what we have, one of the great things that they learned was that the Great Commission that we've just heard sung by the choir and the passage that we will read in a few minutes has become the great omission that most churches are not reaching the lost. The very enterprise that God had placed on this earth for that very purpose. And as we look at their culture and we see what's happening, let me just analyze some of the generations and what's happened in those generations. Some of you are part of the boomer or builder generation pre-1946. You were born before 1946. It was called the greatest generation as they went through World War II. And out of that generation, 65% of the builders were Christians. 
and our Christians. The boomers were the next generation. They were born from 1946 to 1964. And they were called the me generation. It was all about me and everything there, all the things that our culture would say. And 30% or 35% of that gener uh, demographic were Christians. And it was the biggest drop off in history from 65 to 35%. The next generation is called the Buster Generation. You may know it as Generation X. They were born from 1965 to 1979, and 22% of that generation are Christians. You see the trend, 65, 35, 22, and now the millennial generation born between 1980 and 2000. It's the greatest population boom in US history, the largest demographic that's alive today, and 15% of that generation are Christians. And we're seeing the trend of where it was more than 50% to now being less than 15% in this generation. And now there's a new generation that's been born from 2000 to the present day. They call that Generation Z or Generation Z in, the, in Canada, and different things. The millennials have been outpaced by this group. Uh, they represent about 69. We don't know much about them and their trends. It's still too early, but they've been called also the I generation. We really don't have a name for them yet. It will come in the years to come as sociologists study. But it's very fitting when you think about what they have. It's the first generation to be raised on the internet and the changes that have occurred technolo uh, technologically uh, for that generation. What challenges does that have for the church if we are to reach the millennials and the Z generation? What has to change? What strategies would we do differently in order to make that happen? And so when Jesus uh, tells us that we are to be his church, he understands that we're going to be in a culture that will sometimes be even against the Christian faith. It's happened all throughout history, but we are acknowledging that we now live in a nation that's probably a post-Christian nation. Seeing the, the change that's occurred from 65% of the population to now we're 15% of the population of the next generation are believers. But Jesus gives his final message to a group of disciples who he's called to uh, turn the world upside down a group of 12 that he had traveling with him for about three years. And Jesus calls to them and he tells them that this is the message that I have for you. This is your mission for what you're to do next. And the passage is often been called the Great Commission. And what that meant was the final instruction. It was the, uh, the guidelines that Jesus wanted to live, uh, give to his church, the great instruction, the great command. And our strategies and our methods are constantly changing. And here is the something that remains true that holds to this day, something that remains constant. Listen to the word of God in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and following. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. When Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we admit that this passage of Scripture could also be omitted in our lives and in our understanding. So we pray that in hearing it today, we'd be reminded of what you've called for us to do and show us the mission that Cornerstone has for the future. That the church has been placed here to make disciples, to tell those that do not know you how they can find true meaning and hope in this world. And so, Father, I pray for those even in our midst this morning that are curious about who you are, may have doubt and what you do and, and your strength and power. We pray that in the hearing of your word this morning that your Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, that they too would come to know you as Lord and Savior. And for those of us who know you in that way, we pray that you would stir in our hearts to continue the work that you've called us to do where you told others that there were not enough people, their harvest is ripe, but there are few workers. 
and you called your church to pray for the workers to go. And so we thank you that this has been an ascending congregation where we see five of our young families and young people leaving here and going there to serve in different countries. And Lord, we thank you that you have also called us to be a church to witness and be an ambassador to tell others about your good news right here where we live in Overland Park. And we see that your enterprise is throughout the world for all nations and for all people. So we pray that you would stir us in such a way that we would be zealous to make that happen in our lives and through this church. We desire to not be part of the statistics that we've been sharing the last three weeks, that we wouldn't have an autopsy done on us in a few years' time of our death. But instead, we will rejoice and we will pray and that we would exhaust ourselves to do everything necessary to reach the lost. So will you stir our hearts this morning in that way and may the power of your Holy Spirit move in that direction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Jesus has given us a command, and it's a great command to us, and we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 4 the last uh, two weeks. Again, there was the manifesto that Paul had laid out for the church. And now we have a different picture, a different perspective that Jesus paints here. And he says he called the 11 apostles, and in other parts of the scripture you would say, and it might say the apostles' name, and then we were part of the twelve. We realize that we're now down one because Judas has betrayed Jesus in the garden. He was the one who set up Jesus to be arrested by the Romans. And then because of what he acknowledged and began to realize what he had done, he took himself and hung himself by a tree. And now we're down to 11. And Jesus is telling them, go to Galilee. He takes them out of Jerusalem and he sends them back to Galilee where it all began where he called them on the side of a seashore of Galilee, and he said, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll call you to be telling the world of the good news that's found. And so he gives that painted picture that we're all fishermen. And we are to fish for those who are lost. And he tells the disciples this great command. And when he saw them, when they saw him, they began to worship him. But what's fascinating is the next phrase, and some still doubt it. Maybe you're familiar with the story of Thomas who said, you know what, I just don't believe all your words. I need to see it myself. And Thomas is invited to stick his finger into the wounds of Jesus' hands, and then Thomas is able to believe. Well, even at this time, Jesus is about to ascend, and there are people that are still doubting. Is he referring to the apostles that are here? I don't. I believe it's referring to those others that were with them that were there to see this extravaganza that Jesus is about to show to them. And some of them still doubt it. And then the book of Acts tells us in Acts chapter 2 that the power of the Holy Spirit came down on God's people. And then we start seeing them doing great and mighty things because of the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And I believe that's where we start to see the doubt being resolved in the minds of people. But... You know, I just want to take an aside for a moment. If the Bible was a concoction of man to try and tell you to believe in this Jesus, I certainly believe that that would be left out of the story. Because that's not flattering to the Christian faith to have people still doubting in what Jesus has done. He's now just resurrected from the grave, and yet there's still some people who are standing in his midst and don't believe that this has happened. If the scriptures were the concoction of man they would put their best foot forward and here we have a little snippet a reminder that God's not afraid of the doubt of God's people and we see a picture of the power of the scriptures for us it shows the reality that we may have and maybe some of you are wrestling with God you don't know for sure if you're all in or not may the scriptures encourage you and give you hope may they give you strength Now, with that aside, let me talk about what Jesus is saying here. He said, now, hear God's plan for the church. This is how it's going to be laid out. This is what I want you to do when I now leave you. And he gives this command. Now, all authority, both on heaven and in earth and on the earth, have been given to me. 
to Jesus. It's not that Jesus now has new authority because he's resurrected. He had the same authority prior to his resurrection, just coming down out of heaven. All authority came with him. He is God, the second member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he gave away part of his glory that was intended for him so that he would be able to come humbly as a baby in the Bethlehem and come to this world and move into our neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson would say in his passage in the Message Bible. All authority has been given to him. And with that in mind, he then tells the church that go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. All authority is in him, and now all authority is telling us to make disciples. Now, when you hear that phrase, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, most of us make emphasis of the word go. But in the Greek, go is not in the imperative form. Making disciples is. And so really, the translation should say, and in your going, make disciples. And we should understand that wherever we live, in all of our doing and in all of our going, you, God's people, have been designed and have been patterned and have been made for the purpose of making disciples. Now, what does it mean to be a disciple? It means to be a follower of Jesus, that you would walk in his ways, that you would understand who he is, that you would live to serve him for what he's attained. All authority in heaven and on earth is in him. And he is preeminent above all things, all power, all authority. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He is to be first in all things. We saw that on Easter Sunday morning as we looked at the passage in Colossians chapter 1. Jesus has universal authority over everything created, the seen and the unseen. And nothing will hinder him, and nothing will stop what he's doing in this world. If we won't do the job, God will raise up another church to do it. If we're not going to be faithful, God will raise up another faithful seed, another faithful generation to do the same. So when we look at our generational studies and we see the trend of going from 65 to 22 percent down to 15 percent, I'm not worried because I know that God throughout history has raised up a new generation to change. What they're saying about the millennial generation is that they're more committed. That 15% that say they're followers of Jesus are more committed than many of the others of the generations. And that should give us hope. And their desire is to see Christ proclaim. And so even though the number may be small, we realize that God isn't worried about numbers. Remember when he told them to pare down the armies from 30,000 to 500 to 100, he was showing that the power wasn't in the numbers, it was the power of the God they served. And that's true for us when we think about our numbers. We might say, well, we're not as large as some of the mega churches in this country, but God's able to do a great and mighty work in us and through us and has planted us to be able to do so right here and now. And then you've been uniquely designed to reach a people that someone else cannot reach. Now, when I'm invited to parties, I'm not really the one high on the list to be enjoyed at a party. When people find out I'm a a pastor, it's not really, uh, it's actually quite startling. And I've been at many parties where people are cursing and then they say, well, what do you do for a living? And then I put a damper on that party and I move to the next crowd that will allow me to be there. And then I slowly scoot out the door because I'm, hindering. Uh, That's often uh, what, what the pastor can do. I want to tell you that there are people you can reach that I'll never be able to reach because you have been planted, you have been placed where you are to be able to make that happen. Our success in making disciples can only come because of all authority in heaven and on earth is behind us and working in us. It's the power of God doing the work among Cornerstone. And the people that are gathered in this room, the people that say they're part of this local congregation, it's the power of God at work. And if you think he could turn all of the ancient Near East upside down by just 12 
little boys. And the Lord was able to, at the end of the book of Acts, say, and the world was turned upside down as Paul is in Rome and he's about to stand before the presence of the emperor of the universe in human terms. And God has given him a platform. This one who was about to persecute God's people, he was trying to hunt them down and put them to death. And instead, God knocked him off of a horse one afternoon and revealed himself, and he came to become one of the great proclaimers of Jesus Christ throughout history. And we follow in the tradition of what Paul has written as we see it described in the book of Acts, and we write, read his letters and see how the Lord was able to turn a world upside down. And the Lord is saying, therefore, in your going, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You've been designed to make disciples, so it means that in your going, you will make disciples. In your school, you'll make disciples. In your, on your sports team, you'll make disciples. In your workplace, you'll make disciples. In your bridge club, you'll make disciples. In your fitness club, you'll make disciples. And in your neighborhood grocery, you'll make disciples. In the church that I served, the senior pastor would go to the same grocery store and he started to speak to one of the women that was working uh, behind the counter and he kept on talking to her every time she went and she came to Christ and a few weeks later came to our church and we baptized her and we saw her and then the whole congregation continued to walk through the grocery store and start having conversations with people because they saw that it worked in that circumstance and we sometimes doubt that the Lord can do great and mighty things among us in any place. But he said, go to all nations. In your going to all nations, to all peoples, it's now unfolded that every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every gender, every educational background, rich or poor, God desires that every single one of them would come to know him as Lord and Savior. It's a delight to have several in our congregation who are going and have gone to different places, to the Middle East, to New Zealand, to Slovakia, to Ethiopia, to Minnesota, to Thailand this summer. Our congregation has opportunity. We want to provide opportunity for you to go. And maybe the Lord will enlarge your heart to say, you know what, I can be used somewhere. I'm going to go to wherever that may be. And it may be right here in town. It may be at Shields in the soccer field. But to go to all peoples. There's no people group to be left behind. And that's our mission. And that's what Jesus is giving in this passage of scripture. I've been sharing with you that our strategies have to change because we're now in a post-Christian culture. Last week, I was at that conference that I told you about in Atlanta. And a pastor shared his story about how uh, one day he would, went to Starbucks and he decided he would pray for the person in the window when he would go through the drive through and then it dawned on him that he would try to do that every day, and he would go to Starbucks more than just once a day, but he would go, and every time he would go, he'd ask whoever was serving him, how could I pray for you today? And so one lady at the window said, she looked around, she wanted to make sure it was okay for her to have a longer conversation in the window. They usually want the cars to go through pretty fast. She looks around, she quickly says, oh, my grandmother's very ill, will you pray for her? And that's all she says, and off he goes, and he prays for her privately. He never showed himself praying for them. He didn't pray for them in the line. He continued to pray for them when he wasn't present with them. And so he continued to do that week after week, day by day, month after month. And so the next time he goes to the drive-through, he goes to the window, and the manager quickly moves the attendant away from the window and sticks her head out the window and said, I want to tell you something. I need to tell you how you've changed this Starbucks and how this staff has been changed because you have prayed for them. And here the manager of the store, who wasn't a believer, was able to see the effect of one person saying, I'm going to boldly change strategies and do something different in order for those that do not know him to then know him. Do you see how simple it is? It's as simple as praying. And maybe it's even today at lunchtime when you're sitting down and you're ordering your meal and you say to that person who's serving you, how can I pray for you? And you don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to pray in front of the whole restaurant doing that. You can pray for them back home because God can do anything. 
and he can use you in that way. Are we going to be intentional? I hope that we begin to see that the change that needs to occur in Cornerstone is that we be intentional in what we do about the kingdom work of God. And we begin to pray, Lord, open up doors of opportunity. Lord, give us a chance. Give me somebody to speak to this afternoon. Maybe that will be a prayer that some of you will offer this morning as you sit in these comfortable seats. And you'd be surprised at what the Lord will do for you and the divine appointments that will be made by the Lord for you and opportunities. So when a a tradesman comes into my house, I always try to make a conversation, turn to where I have the opportunity to share the gospel. They're in my home. They got to listen. They're going to be paid. So why not take the opportunity? And so I've had the opportunity just in the past year of multiple times being able to share with them because they always say, well, what do you do? Why are you here? Where did you move from? And I'm able to politely say I'm a pastor. And then you see the face change and then you see the change that goes on. Uh, But the Lord opens up opportunities for us to do so. And he said, I want you to make disciples and then I want you to baptize them. You see, baptism is an outward sign of your relationship to the Lord. So you faithfully come in baptism. It's not that baptism saves the person. That's not what this passage is saying. But it's saying that you're now pledging allegiance to be part of God's kingdom, to be part of his church. And baptism is the entrance into that relationship. And when you do baptize them, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been the ones that have changed your life. God is the one who adopts you and calls you to be his children. Jesus is the one who came and did the work so that we could be his children. And then the Holy Spirit is the one who makes sure and guarantees that we will be his children in the day that he comes again. And so when we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're acknowledging that all authority in heaven and on earth is in them. And that power is on display when a life is changed, when transformation, when you came to Christ, the power of God was at work in changing your life. And that radical transformation is unbelievable. And so people write hymns called Amazing Grace. Or the deep, deep love of Jesus. And we see the hymns representing because we understand what God has done in order to rescue us and bring hope to our hearts that are not satisfied with the things that this world has to offer. And he plants the church and he said, go and make disciples. In your going, make sure you make disciples, followers of Jesus. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son. And then not only baptize them, teach them. And so that's the ministry of the church that we continue to teach. And what did he teach them about? Observe all that I've commanded you. We are to make disciples. It's not just so that they come to a conversion in their life, but they ongoing grow that disciples is an ongoing part of our life. We call it sanctification in the scriptures. It means that perfecting, that being made holy, being set apart. And that's what God does in the life of a believer. He begins the work, and he will continue it all the way to the end. And that end is every day that we have upon this earth, God is at work. We're under construction, and God is doing something in our life. He's growing us, and we are called to teach them the words of Jesus and to follow his commands. And Jesus is not saying do outward actions. His message is to our heart. I've been sharing that with the uh, ironworks on Thursday morning. It's a matter of our heart. It's not outward religion that Jesus is trying to establish here. It is a deep-seated heart relationship with God because God transforms our heart in our salvation. He gives us a new heart to love him and to cherish him. And so as we make disciples, we are teaching them to observe and follow the commands. A command like this to deny yourselves and take up the cross and follow me. That's a very powerful message and a challenging message to those who do not know him. So we help the lost world know how to be found. We tell those who live in darkness how they can find light. We tell those who are thirsty where they can find water. We tell those who are weary where they can find rest. We tell those who are hungry where to find bread. That's the mission of the church. It's the mission God has given to you. You've been designed for that very purpose. You can reach people that others cannot and the Lord has placed you in this time in this period and in this location for that very purpose and all the authority in heaven and on earth is behind you 
And God will work through you. And it will say this at the end of this passage. He is with you always, even to the end of the age. In the beginning of the book of Matthew, it tells you the story. And his name will be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And he closes the book of Matthew in chapter 28 in the last verses, saying the very same thing. He is with you always, even to the end of the age. So when we struggle and wonder if Cornerstone can continue on, when we go through struggles and difficulties, we are reminding ourselves that God is with us even to the end of the age. He is Emmanuel. He is with us. So when I read the book this week called The Autopsy of the Deceased Church, Tom Rainer said this, Our autopsy revealed that the churches had become self-centered and self-gratifying. As they began to analyze what was happening to these churches that died, they had turned inward instead of being outward focused. So he went on to say this, but more than any one item, these dying churches focused on their own needs instead of others. They looked inwardly instead of outwardly. Their highest priorities were the way they've always done it. And that's what made them the most comfortable. Those in the church are more concerned about protecting the way they did church than reaching the residents of the community. And when a church ceases to have the heart and ministry for its community, it's on the path toward death. That was the analysis that they began to see. The common denominator among all these churches that had died was that they had turned inward and no longer had a desire, and they became comfortable in their pews. They became comfortable with the people that were present. They didn't see much growth happening. They never saw baptisms occurring. They saw everything decline. We need to find ways to reach into our community, to be poured out of the salt shaker and into the world. Because in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is going to tell us that we are the salt and the light of the world. We're a city on a hill. We are meant to be poured into the lives of people. And we need to be intentional about it if we want to survive. Are we a church that will do everything possible to reach the lost? Are we a church that are going to bankroll everything possible to make that happen? As we start thinking about building and putting up a new structure on our new property, are we going to be thinking about how we should build it in order to reach others? not to be just a greenhouse for God's people, but a way that we are able to reach and pour our lives into others. And I hope you will see that the best days are ahead, that we won't keep saying, well, the glory days were behind us. Why would we think that God can't do something even greater in the life of Cornerstone in the years to come? So I hope I can turn that half empty glass into a half full glass. So that you would say, yes, the Lord has something greater and so much more for us to do in this world. The Lord desires that we would have transformed lives that would then transform our community. When I was in seminary, I was given the opportunity to study in my missions class a man by the name of William Carey, who in 1761 had come to Christ and now he desired to be a missionary and he was sent to India in the 1700s and he went there and he flourished because of his mission and he understood that he was to make disciples in his going and he was going to India and now he went there to plant churches. He was there to start hospitals. He went there and started a bank. He helped people in their need. He made sure that there were foster homes for children that were needing it. He started a newspaper. He started a Christian college all because he was seeking a new strategy to reach the lost. And in that period of time, he saw many come to the Lord. And he said this statement that has been heard by many in the church ever since. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And that's a message that I want to pour into us as a cornerstone. Expect great things ahead and attempt great things. John Haggai, maybe you've heard of him, said something similar. Attempt something so great for God that it's doomed to failure unless God is in it. 
attempts something so great for God that it's doomed for failure unless God is in it. Why? Because if we do something by our own hands, we're going to boast in what we were able to accomplish. But when it was never possible for us to do it, all we can say is, isn't that amazing? Look what God did. There's a big difference there. And the power of God will be seen in our communities, and they will rejoice, just as the scriptures say. So let's pray.